a new keyword, our last keyword for chapter four. Um, and this keyword is called static. Uh, you've seen it before, but we just haven't focused on it. And you've actually taken advantage of it before, but we haven't focused on that either. So hopefully today we'll kind of fill in some of these like gaps in our understanding, things that maybe we were curious about and didn't make sense at the time. Hopefully we'll make sense now. Um, at the top of the Caesar Cipher class is an example of the static keyword. Um, we have private, static, final, string, alphabet, and then a whole bunch of characters here. Um, we know that private means that other code in other classes won't be able to access this variable. We know that final means that once this variable is initialized, we can't change its value. Um, but static is new. So we're going to focus on what static means today, both in the context of variables as well as in the context of methods. That was weird. Okay. That's a new projector. I'm hopeful, hopefully it keeps working. Um, so let's give it a shot. So let's capture what static actually means. Here's my definition of like what static means. Um, static means same value for the variable for all objects of the class. So when you think of static, think of same for all objects. To make a connection here that may help you, this is like class attributes in Python. Same thing. So that might be a good connection point. Um, so static variables have the same value for all objects of the class. So if I have a dozen Caesar cipher objects, they will all have exactly the same value for this variable alphabet. Okay. Um, and this is useful for a variety of reasons. Uh, which which we'll get to here in a moment. Um, in fact, not only do all objects have the same value, but I don't even need an object to access this value. I can access it directly through the class, which is super convenient. So static class variables can be accessed directly through the class. Here are some examples. So how would I do this with alphabet? I'd say Caesar Cipher, the class name, dot alphabet. Okay. This is a big change. We're used to only having variables that refer to objects before the dot operator and then refer to methods or, or variables. Now it's a class, okay? We can use this syntax to refer to static things. Because alphabet is static, I don't need a variable referencing an object here. I can just use the class name. Another example where this shows up um, a lot is with the math class, the capital M math class. There's math.py. Math.py is a static class variable of the math class, right? Which makes perfect sense. Why would I need to create a new math object? What would that even mean? I'm not sure. Um, I can just uh, refer to pi by saying math.py. On the third day of school, you were using static class variables when you said color dot red, okay? When we were doing all this turtle stuff or when you're doing your target and we're using colors, we didn't really know, well, probably didn't know why like it worked the way it worked. Now hopefully it makes a little bit more sense. When you say capital C color dot red, red is a static class variable of the color class. That's why we use that syntax to choose colors for turtles or, or painting or whatever we're doing. If alphabet wasn't static, then one potential downside of that is every time we make a new Caesar cipher object, that object would contain a instance variable called alphabet, which would refer to a string object in the computer's memory. In this particular case, it wouldn't really matter much, um, but that is one reason to have something static, is if like not every object needs its own different version of it. Um, more commonly, however, we use static for our class variables because we want to be able to change an instance variable and have all objects refer to that together, okay? Um, it shows up in some common patterns to have something like that. 
Finally, as we're going to see in a moment, if the variable doesn't have anything to do with the state of an object, it can be convenient if we make it static because it allows us to use it in static methods as well. And that's what we're going to see next. So we can use static with a variable like we did here. But now let's scroll all the way to the bottom of this file and we're going to write one final method that also um, uses this new static keyword. Let's write the method header first. So this method's gonna be public and it's gonna be static. And we'll explain, well, what does that mean for a method in just a moment? It's gonna return a reference to a new string. The name in the method is generate key phrase. And it takes one parameter of type int, which is the length of the key phrase. Why would we want a method to be static? Well, this the purpose of this method, actually let's capture the purpose of this method in a Java doc. The purpose of this method is this method generates a pseudo random key phrase of the specified length in characters. So think about when you're uh, going to a website, you have to create a new account. They wanna know your email address and they want you to specify your password twice. Um, but Chrome says, hey, I suggest this password. And you can just click on the suggested password and use that instead. Maybe people who are using our Caesar Cipher class, they want to encrypt their text, but they don't want to come up with their own password. They want our class to generate a random password, which we call key phrase for them. So that's what this method does. It generates a random key phrase for them. Um, and that parameter is again, the length the length uh, is called length, and it is the number of characters in the key phrase. So we can generate key phrases of different length. And what we return, I'm going to copy this because I have a real tough time spelling pseudo random. Return a pseudo random key phrase of the specified length. So that's what this method does, but a good question is like, well, why does it need to be static, right? Like none of our other methods are static. Well, again, think of our user who wants to generate a random key phrase and then use that for their Caesar cipher. If we go up and look at the constructor that we wrote some time ago, the constructor for our Caesar cipher object takes the key phrase as a parameter. So we can't make a new Caesar cipher object without a key phrase. But if this method wasn't static, we wouldn't be able to generate a key phrase without an object, right? It's like one of these chicken and egg problems. So it's advantageous to have this be static because as we'll see in a moment, we don't need to have a Caesar cipher object in order to call this method. All of that said, perhaps most importantly though, a method in a class should be static if that method is totally independent of the state of the object. If it doesn't need to access or change the values of any instance variables, then it probably should be a static method. Um, and so let's capture these like trade-offs up above here as, as a description. So this method is static. Um, and therefore, I'm gonna focus on like the main design guide for this and therefore is independent, independent of the state of a Caesar cipher object. That's the primary reason to make a method static. Okay. This method is not gonna access any instance variables. This method is not gonna change any instance variables. Yet this method is related to a Caesar cipher uh, class. So it's still like coherent. It just doesn't deal with the state of an object. So that's why we would make it static. Here's the implications of doing so. As a result, oops, result, this method may be invoked on the class instead of a variable that references an object. Maybe, it doesn't have to be, we can still invoke this like regular non-static methods, but it can be invoked directly on the class and it looks like this. 
Caesar cipher dot generate key phrase. Okay. Very similar syntax as to when we had our static class variable. Right. Instead of a variable that references an object, we're using the class name directly here, still using the dot operator to call the method, pass the argument, all of that stuff. So similar here between static class variables and static methods. But what I want to be super clear about is like an additional restriction here is that this method cannot access any instance variables or invoke any non-static methods. Think of it this way, there is no this, right? So because this is a static method, there's no this. So we can't access an instance variable because usually we say this dot in the instance variable name. There's no reference to an object. There's no object, there's no this. We can't call a non-static method because if you think through our conceptual model for calling methods, the first blank on the form is what's the value of this? We don't have a value for this. There is no this. So inside of a static method, you cannot access non-static variables in the class. You cannot invoke any non-static methods in the class. Those are the restrictions. If you keep those rules straight, you'll be just fine. But those are the restrictions. All right, so we dealt with why we would do it. We dealt with how we could invoke it. We dealt with what restrictions we have. Let's actually implement this method because um, it will be useful for our users. Um, I'm gonna create a local variable called key phrase. I'm gonna initialize it to an empty string and eventually we're gonna return it. But we're gonna focus on how we randomly generate a key phrase of the specified length. And our algorithm is basically gonna to be to randomly choose one letter from the alphabet for each character in the key phrase. And we'll just keep concatenating it together one letter at a time. That's it. Um, unfortunately, that means we do need a looping structure and yes, we won't really study these till the next unit, but this is similar to the one we used before. We'll create a for loop that basically will run the number of times based on the value of length. And the way we do that is we say i equals zero, i is less than length, i plus plus, and we will break this apart into all of its details in our next unit. But for now, this if length is 10, this loop will ensure the code inside of these curly brackets will run 10 times. The way that we have approached this in the past um, is by creating a new random object and calling the next int method. And that is a fine approach. And it was great in our first unit because we were learning how to call methods on objects. Uh, the downside of that approach is it is not on your AP CSA quick reference. So you don't have access to that um, on our exam or on the AP test. So I'm gonna show you a different method that is on your AP CSA quick reference, um, but it's a static method. So that's why we didn't use it before. I didn't wanna confuse things, but now that we're learning about static, um, here's a static method that can help us. So this is the first of several methods we're gonna learn on the math class. So the math.random static method. And in fact, all methods on the math class are static because it doesn't make any sense to create a math object. I don't know what that would mean or model. Um, so all the methods on the math class are static. And the math.random static method returns a double and it always returns a double between zero inclusive and one exclusive. So the syntax I'm using here a square bracket for a range means inclusive and an open bracket or an open parenthesis for a range um, means uh, exclusive. So the math.random static method doesn't take any parameters. It always returns a number between zero inclusive and one exclusive, but that's fine, okay? Um, it still gives us a random number. We can still come up with an algorithm just like you all did on the previous exam 
um, to generate a range of random integers. And we do this a lot. I can't recall an AP free response exam for any year that didn't have you do this um, with this method at some point. So we'll use this all year long. So often we use the following algorithm. So I'm gonna give you the algorithm right here in the notes. It's also in another document if you need to refer to it later. Um, but often we use the following algorithm to generate random integers from min inclusive to max inclusive. Just like we did on the last test, but here's the new method. So we can say int n equals, we do need to cast. That's another reason why we didn't use this method till now. And I'm gonna do math.random, takes no arguments. That returns a number between zero inclusive and one exclusive. I'm gonna multiply it by the range of all the numbers I wanna include which you may remember is max minus min plus one. And then I'll add min at the end. Even though this is a new method, this algorithm should look familiar, okay? It's very similar to what we had on the last test. I think you should be able to devise this on your own. And as you're getting to that point, I think you should memorize it in the interim until you get there. Um, because we use it so much. Here's an example. We want to generate a random integer between zero inclusive and 25 inclusive because we have this string, which I'm gonna type in the comment here for reference. We have this string for the alphabet. Um, I'm gonna do all the letters and I'm gonna separate them by spaces because we're gonna look at indices. A, B, oh, this is gonna be tedious. C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. K L M N O P Q R S T U V W X Y Z. Whew. That's our string. No spaces, right? In the string, all the letters are together. But in our string at index zero is the letter I, A. At index one is B, index two is C, index three is D, four, five, G is uh, six. And then like on it goes, I'm not gonna type them all in. And then eventually Z will be at index 25. These are our indices. We care about this because we're about to use the substring method to, to find our random variables or random characters. Here's why this algorithm works because math.random can return zero. Um, and in our case, if this is our equation here, um, well, here, let's actually write the code and then we'll talk through why it works. So we're gonna have a local variable letter index. I'm gonna copy this algorithm and simplify it based on a max value of 25, a min value of zero. So it's gonna simplify to math.random multiplied by 26 and then cast it to an int. The reason why this works is if math.random returns zero, zero times 26 is zero, okay, that'll get me a letter A. Math.random will never return one, but it could return 0 0.9999999, whatever. Um, that times 26 is, well, just less than 26 is 25, 0 0.9999999, whatever. And when I cast that to an int, it gets truncated, and we get a value of 25. So this will give me a nice range of integers between zero and 25. And then I can use my key phrase variable and concatenate on the end of it. Reference Caesar cipher dot alphabet. Hey, that's our static variable from up above. I can access it in this static method because this variable is static. And on that, I will call the substring method and I'll pass letter index as our starting index and letter index plus one as the ending index because we go up to, but not including that ending index. And that will randomly choose one of the 26 letters from the string alphabet and concatenate it to the end of key phrase. 
So now we have our own little key phrase, random generator, which is kind of cool. This might just be me, but I'll share this with you in case it applies to you as well. I personally get confused sometimes between the static keyword and the final keyword, okay? Because they kind of seem like they're doing the same thing, at least based on their names. When I see final in my head, I think this is the final value for this variable. And that helps me keep track of what final means. And when I see static, I think in my head, this is the same, for me, like static same, the S's reinforce each other. This is the same value for all objects. And that's how I keep static and final straight um, because I think they're, the words themselves can be easily conflated, so. All right, we are almost done with all the Caesar Cypher stuff. We can almost encrypt stuff, which is super cool. We're gonna change over to the Caesar Cipher demo class because now we can actually create um, a new Caesar Cipher object. We already had code that created a scanner. We already had code that prompted the user to enter the text to encrypt and prompted the user for the key phrase and prompted the user for how many seconds it would take to guess that key phrase. So now finally, after all this time, we can actually make a new Caesar Cipher object. So we're gonna create a local variable of type Caesar Cipher, named Cipher, and we're gonna create a new Caesar Cipher object. And that constructor requires a single argument, which is the key phrase. So there we go. Oops. Cancel. Sorry, closed the wrong window. There we go. Now that we've actually created a Caesar Cipher object, we can get, with a key phrase, we can get a sense of how secure is this? Remember the real answer, it's not at all. But let's say we are trying to crack this by hand because we don't have computers. Let's retrieve the complexity description from the class. And we'll do that by on the Cipher variable, we'll invoke the get complexity description method. And we'll pass seconds per guess. So like, let's say if it takes like five seconds for us to check by hand um, a given key phrase, then we can see how long it's gonna take to crack this thing by hand. And then let's actually print that out because it'd be cool to see. So I'm gonna print out the complexity and I'll concatenate on that string returned from the method. And then let's actually do the useful thing. Let's generate the encrypted text. On our cipher variable, we'll invoke the encrypt method and we'll pass the string that the user typed in up above called text. And then we'll print the encrypted text. At this point, everything should compile. You might have a few leftover typos um, that will need to be corrected. You might find that you're missing something from some point over the past several days when we wrote this, in which case you can access my period seven GitHub notes um, through Canvas module and grab whatever little missing piece you need. But at this point we can run it, which is super cool. Um, we can switch over and run the main method on the Caesar Cipher demo class. And I, we can have something to encrypt. Looking forward to AP practice questions. What's my key phrase? Hmm, AP CSA Java. 
it'll get compressed. I don't need to worry about that. Let's say it takes five seconds to guess each one. Wow. If we were trying to crack this by hand in a brute force way, it would take over 13 years to crack this. It would take a computer a fraction of a second, but it would take us 13 years. Um, and there's the encrypted text. Very cool. Again, please don't actually use this for any encryption, but it's a fun example.